and God's character. When we make much of Him, it gives us a foundation. When we know Him, it gives us a foundation. It's the character of God that we rest in in times like this. That's where the calm comes from and the confidence. It comes from knowing Him. If you know Him, that's where the calm comes from. Psalm 43, verse 3 says this. Oh, send out the light and send out your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Then will I go unto the altar of God and unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise you, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. My hope, my help, my health is in the hands of God. That's where it is. Send out thy truth. Send out thy light. That's what we need to keep our eyes on. Lord God, we... We come before you and like the psalmist of old, Lord, we need to be led forth by truth, by clear light, the light that shines forth into the darkness of this world, the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the light that you've given us that we may no longer dwell in darkness, but that we may walk in truth. And we trust you. You are our exceeding joy. That's who you are to us, and we will exalt you. Lord, in our nation, there is great panic and concern and fear. There are people who are sick. There are those who are vulnerable, the elderly in our society that are wondering what next. And maybe if we're learning anything in these days is that every life is truly important that life conceived in the womb and that life that is still taking its breath. The oldest in our society, every person has value in your eyes. And I pray God that we would see that and that we would recognize the vulnerable in our midst. We pray for our president. He desperately needs you, Lord. He needs you. I'm grateful that he declared this as a national day of prayer. I'm grateful for our vice president who so clearly knows you, and I'm grateful for his counsel that he gives our president. And for any godly counsel that comes to the ear of our president, we are grateful. Surround him. Protect him. Our leaders, Lord, some of which we disagree with greatly. And yet you told us to pray for those who are in authority. They need you. We need them to depend on you. We need them to trust in you. Lord, and when they don't trust in you, we trust in you. And we know that your hand is greater, that you are a sovereign God, and that there is no one like you, and that, that you oversee the affairs of men, and that whatever is happening, that you are capable of taking all things and working those things out for good. You're the only one who can do that. And so, Lord God, we pray for um, those who in a position of authority in our cities, our, our elected officials, our, our school board, our teachers, our superintendents, Lord, our governors, our, our senators and congressmen, Lord, so many that their decisions affect how we live our lives. And we ask, God, that you would give them wisdom as they are sorting through their own emotions and working through, Lord, the specifics on how to best care for our, for our people. And I pray, Lord, that as we trust in you in these things, that you will remind us that, um, that you do not turn a deaf ear to those who call upon your name, that you don't turn away, you're not blind, you're not on vacation. You're not somewhere busy about 
other things and unconcerned about our lives, that you are very much in control. We trust you for that. And from that understanding of who you are that your word teaches us and that we're learning about, from the very character, from your very heart, we can rest in you and we can be calm. Help us to keep our faith intact and that we would be rational, we would be people who trust you in all that goes on and help us to be prepared to share the gospel with those who need it to our right and to our left, I pray.
Psalm 63, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. To see your power and your glory, so as I've seen you in the sanctuary. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. This will I bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. That's what he says he will do. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you day and night in the night watches, because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings will I rejoice. Look at the imagery. My soul follows hard after you. Your right hand upholds me. My soul follows hard after you. Would you be able to just kneel right where you are or seat, be seated right where you are? And let's just go before the Lord in prayer again, kneeling. Lord God, we continue to come before you this morning and as the psalmist said, follow hard after you. With every ounce of our being, with all of our affections, with our heart, our soul, and our mind, you told us to love you and to have no idols before you, no other things that would captivate our heart, consume our resources, require and demand, demand our attention. But God, that you would be worshiped exclusively and that we would pursue you hard, follow hard, stretching with every ounce of our being all that you've given us, the breath of life itself, pursuing you because in your great love, you pursued us. Your word says, we love you because you first loved us. Thank you, Lord. We lift our hearts up to you this morning. We lift our hands up to you this morning, Lord God. And we stretch out. Lord God, calm the fears of your people. Bring strength, bring salvation bring hope, bring encouragement. Help us to be a light, your light, your truth when we leave this place of worship. God, help us to bring your name to bear in dark places. Just to speak of you when when chaos seems to want to control the circumstance, help us to remain calm because nothing changed this week about you. It seems like a lot has changed about us in our circumstances, but nothing, nothing, oh God, has changed about you. You are the one constant, always remaining ever present with us and we are your children and we rejoice this morning and for anyone listening to these words and Lord sensing the movement of your spirit in their life if they do not know you may they call upon your name now may they trust in the one name that has been given among men by which we must be saved the name of Jesus may they call upon your name May they recognize that in the instant they call on your name, that you are there, you are there to bring salvation and to bring strength and all that's necessary. We love you, Lord. We love you.
with surrendered to the mighty cross of Jesus Christ the earth would shake beneath the weight of darkened skies on his brow a crown of sorrow for a was our strength no word he spoke his love was shown for all to see oh the cross of Jesus Christ is the
good. It, uh, I just spent 24 hours with her in a car. And um, no, that's a good thing. Let, let me clarify. Uh, I get to hear that all the time. And it's just, man, it's a, it's a blessing. You guys did an amazing job. So thank you all. Well, uh, as you know, if you were in your Connect group, uh, Jeremy Walker wrote this week's lesson, and in it he was dealing in Numbers 10 through 14, right? And if you remember when I interviewed at that moment that Brother Joe so kindly put my phone number on the screen for everyone uh, to start texting me, it was at that point that um, Numbers 14, 21, one of my favorite verses, uh, it says, As truly as I live, the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And praise God that in spite of everything going on around us, in spite of all the craziness, in spite of whatever this looks like, that the earth can still be filled with the glory of the Lord. And that it is filled with the glory of the Lord. Sometimes we just turn a blind eye to that. So as we're in numbers, right, and if you're doing your reading, you, you made it through, and you're hopefully turning the corner into to judges and getting really, really good with people putting stakes in people's heads and just all sorts of just awesome stuff coming up. Uh, I wanted to, to remind us of something in Numbers as we get ready to go and uh, to also understand that this was, was not pre-planned with the state of what's going on right now. But if you look at Numbers as it transitions to chapter 15, there's all these laws given, right? And, and all these laws that don't really seem to make much sense about sacrifices and when I accidentally sin, what's supposed to happen? And then it kind of transitions to all this grumbling, right? And, and God's people are like, this is ridiculous. We had it so much better when we were slaves. You know, when they were beating us and whipping us and working us harder and starving us, we were so much better then. And all of a sudden, there's this little riff happening. And as this happens... One of the most amazing passages in my mind concerning this comes up in number 16, and it transitions to all these people being upset over nothing. Now, do we have any Office fans in here? Like, besides me, the students, and, and thank you, Miss Gail, right? Let me tell you what happens in one of these episodes is that there's a guy named Jim and Pam. Well, Pam was dating Roy and engaged to Roy forever. They weren't ever going to get married, whole other rabbit troll there. And all of a sudden, Roy finds out that Pam and Jim kind of had this thing, which they shouldn't have had, a whole other issue. And Roy comes in to beat him up. He's going to take care of Jim. And Roy's a big guy like me. Um, and so, thank you. So what ends up happening is Roy comes storming in, and the guy that they all make fun of stands up and he like boom pepper sprays him in the face and Roy goes down and the guy Dwight that did that's like crying he's like for all these years they made fun of me he's got the pepper spray in his eyes you know and and he saved the day and he stood up and then it was this kind of great funny moment because he also has like nunchucks and a bow staff and just weird stuff don't be like him but as this is going on this is really kind of where we find what we're going to look at briefly today is that all of a sudden there's this crazy tension building up in number 16. And as it continues, really this incredible thing happens. And I'm going to read it to you and we're going to quickly look at this and try to make sense of it. God's word in number 16, 46 says this, And Moses said to Aaron, Take your incense burner and put fire on it, from off the altar and lay incense on it and carry it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For the wrath has gone out from the Lord, the plague has begun. So Aaron took it as Moses said and ran into the midst of the assembly and behold, the plague had already begun among the people. But he put incense and made atonement for the people. Verse 48. Now he stood between the dead and and the living, and the plague was stopped. You guys see that? He stood between the living and the dead, and the plague was stopped. You see, what's happening in 46 is God's wrath is being poured out on Israel. Why? Because they're grumbling, they're turning to these false gods, they're doing all these things they knew that they were commanded by God not to do. 
And you see, whenever we live in constant rebellion, we can expect that our sin is going to keep us separated from God. They weren't able to be there, much like Joshua, as our pastor likes to preach once a year, right? They're on one side of the sea, and they're waiting, and the army is coming, and the Lord provides this safe passage for them. So here we see this internal tension built up of what's going to happen, what's going to go with the plague, what are we going to do, how is this going to turn out for us? And while there's this crazy panic going on, like being wrapped around H-E-B to get in, right? Some of y'all were in line, I'm just saying. But as this crazy tension is built up, look at what the Lord says, or look what happens. Aaron and Moses continue to be faithful. As there's all this chaos, this confusion, and people are are, are passing away at this high rate. And by the way, 150,000 people die daily. If nothing else, that should compel us to be missional. As we see with this plague, Aaron continues to be faithful when it's not convenient, when it's not popular, and the only thing that saves him is the very presence of God. God's presence is going to be the thing to save them. So look at verse 48. This is where I want to camp for about three minutes and wrap up. Students are like, that ain't going to be three minutes. All right, it says this, And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stopped. Y'all, he stood between the living and the dead. And I know I'm making much of that, but don't miss it. As believers, that's what we do. You see, we see people who were dead in their sins, who were dying, again, at a rate of 150,000 a day. And we have to be the ones to stand in the middle of the plague. We have to be the ones to, who are willing to stop that plague. You see, this is far bigger than some crazy thing going on worldwide right now. This is the difference between life and death. And people are dying. And it is up to us as the local body of Christ and the universal church to get up and to stand and say, we are going to bridge that gap. The very bridge that Christ died in order to complete, we get to stand on his shoulders, on his completed work, and say, I'm going to stop this plague. And we may not stop it for everyone, right? But we can stop it for Dylan or for Sean or for your neighbor or your Aunt Irene or whoever it is in your life, you can be willing to stand on what Christ's completed work did and stop this plague. It's incredible. No matter how lost people seem, guys, we've got to be active. You see, as Christians, again, we get to stand on that. So I want to ask you this. Who do you know that's living among the dead? See, there was a show on TMC called The Walking Dead. You guys probably saw that, right? About all these people that were dead, but not really, and kind of, but weird, right? And they were trying to figure out, what's the cure? What do we do? How do we stop this? How do we stop these people that are walking as dead people and bring them alive? You see, the Bible says that we are dead in our sins, but it's only through Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection that we are made alive in him. So we can stop the plague. We can stop this for so many of the people around us, but what it takes to stop the plague is us to be willing to do it. So what happens? The plague stopped. They stopped the plague. All of the the, the dying, the, the horrible things, the despair, the mourning that would have occurred, all of that stops because... One guy was faithful. See that? Aaron, he was faithful. He and Moses, they stood together and they were able to be faithful. So the church, I want us to understand that as we leave here, we are called out to draw people in to the church. We are called to leave where we are, the comfort of this building. And y'all, we have a beautiful facility, a beautiful building. But if this is all we are, we've just become a country club for the saved as opposed to a hospital for the sick. And as a church, I want to encourage you that everything that we need to be about needs to see the living and the dead, and we need to be willing to stand right there with them in the middle of it to stop this plague that lives can be saved. Let's pray. And I want to encourage you that with whatever happens, that we be a reasonable voice, not irrational. So let's pray. And then uh, I got a a, a few things to bring up. And I'd encourage you, feel free to respond where you are. We're not going to do a traditional um, invitation. But if God is working in your heart in any way, maybe he's placed a neighbor in your heart that you need to be praying for. Whatever that looks like, respond where you are. And then I want to wrap up with just a couple of thoughts. 
Uh, Lord, we love you. We're so thankful for your love and your grace, the fact that you died for us. Lord, I pray that I would stop the plague. God, I pray that our church members, our body, would go out of here and that we would stop the plague in this community, Lord, the plague of sin, of the death that it brings, and that through your completed work that we can help to bring them to life. Lord, allow us to do that. Allow us to be so mission-minded, Lord. God, please, and God, if there's anyone in this room that's still walking among the dead, Lord, they don't know you. The Bible says that they are dead in their sins and their trespasses with no hope. Lord, let them see that that hope is you. And so, God, if there is anyone like that, I pray that you would draw them to you, that we can celebrate that. In your name we pray, amen. Uh, real quick, as they get ready to, to, to sing, again, I just want to remind you that um, if you're not following us on social media, as you need to, that's how we're going to be communicating in the days ahead. And then um, also one kind of final note is we do have some offering plates here. We're not going to be passing them. But as you leave, if God has put on your heart to give, we would ask that you would do that. Thank you. Amen. Stand with me. We'll close in song. Great is the faithfulness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father.